I was able to beat 25 games to 100% completion in 2023. Maybe a personal best. So here's a quick review of each in alphabetical order. These are just little recaps of course, so I won't be diving too deep on anything. Just wanted to bring up like the one or two biggest points I had about each and how I felt about them, starting with the indie game Axiom Verge 2. The first game impressed me so much that I thought the sequel would be just as good, if not better. Sadly it was neither. Though it is still impressive that both of these games were created by one guy, Tom Happ, who clearly knows his classic games. I feel that for everyone who said I could make a better game than this growing up, Tom decided to prove it. With the first folks on having an insane collection of guns with different effects like in Ratchet and Clank, getting only a boomerang and a handful of different melee weapons this time really underwhelmed me. Not only that, but there was a bit too much focus and dependence on being in the droid form this time. However, once you get your body back, I felt this game was much more enjoyable as it felt like you were now part of the world and really opened up at the perfect time with the available abilities on hand, making the game feel more focused on the exploration side rather than the fighting. On the story side of things, as complex as they were, I enjoyed traces more in Axiom Verge 1 more than Indra's in this. By the end though, I felt hers had a bit more impact on me as well as to the overall franchise. I just wish it continued to use character portraits during dialogue so I could relate a bit more, rather than just seeing an orange or purple floating hologram on screen. I prefer actually knowing what they look like rather than imagining it. Now with Control, I wound up playing this just because Alan Wake 2 was nominated for some awards, as I wanted to play something from Remedy to see what they were about. Really the only thing that wowed me on this were the actual controls of the game. As soon as the game started I felt they were so smooth, especially once you're floating around rooms gutting down baddies. Just felt the speed of Jesse's mechanics went well with the pace of the fights. My favorite mechanic was simply just grabbing debris from around the room and throwing it back at enemies. This really was enough to get me through the entire game. I felt the other skills weren't even needed. In the end though, this game felt more like a metroidvania to me more than anything. Trying to even find some enemies was hard, as it felt like the respawn rate was really low after you've already finished the story segment of an area, leading to some achievements and missions taking a lot longer than they should have just because there was nothing to shoot at. The story felt like we were already missing an entire act by the start of the game, with Jessie monologuing all the exposition about her childhood, the events leading up to her entering the foundation, and the unknown entity speaking to her this whole time. Even by the end of the game, nothing's really changed except the condition of her brother and her now having a job. Of all the plot they threw at you, the most interesting to me was the creepy Threshold Kid videos you could come across. The more you saw of them though, the more I noticed they started to lean more towards comedy rather than creepy, so I wish they kept with that tone for the first few you found. I don't know what missing in actions is, but I sure wish someone would find her. I'll help you look, Telfer. We'll find your mama together. When I've talked to some Control fans, the only constant that's brought up is the Ashtray Maze. Even with people praising the maze moment of the game, and as good as it was, I don't think a two minute fight can make up for an entire game of white empty rooms and the same repetitive soldier enemies with just bigger number stats to stop you. Look, if you've read or watched DBZ and are a fan, you grew up with this story. You know the story. You know the characters. The Kakarot game is no different, but the contents of this game are what make it the best version so far. You can fly or walk all over the world, play baseball, see every iconic location from the franchise. Did you know Yamcha lived only one mountain away from Goku? Make wishes and most of all... No, 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 no! The only problem this game had was the actual fighting. It was so repetitive that it can be broken down to keep punching until the enemy glows red, then block their attack, which can be said for every random encounter and every boss. What I was confused by most about this game was for a game called Kakarot, you don't play as him often. And this is of course with the game being tied to the story, he's always off in a coma, training, or dead. So Gohan and Piccolo become your most used characters. Even the rest of the Z fighters become too low level due to them being out of the story too often that it becomes worthless to even bother playing with some of them, especially with how levels take so long to grind that it's just not worth it. This was later fixed in the DLC, but I don't need to pay $20 to remember Bardock's story. The cherry on top of this game I'd say is that it tries to use side quest missions to explain some events that occurred during the time skips throughout the story, almost acting like filler episodes to the show like Bulma and Vegeta's relationship starting, or 18 wanting to be a better wife. And the best one, of course, is Gohan's descent into guilt for Goku's death versus Cell, ignoring Chi-Chi's pleas to become a good kid again, always staying in Super Saiyan form because it's the last thing Goku taught him, and actually going to train with Vegeta in preparation for the next threat on Earth. While he's doing all this, Piccolo and Krillin are trying to convince him to go to school and live his life like Goku would have wanted. This game's a good alternative if you're looking to rewatch the show, but just don't have the time to watch that many episodes. 
This game just keeps on giving. After putting in almost 300 hours, it continues to add more reasons to keep it installed. This year they offered their biggest DLC to date and focus entirely on Castlevania content, including an entire soundtrack, four new areas, and a ton of new weapons and skins. With a new DLC, it also meant another batch of achievements were also added to the game, so I was back at work tracking them all down in the process of seeing everything the patch had to offer. Safe to say, this content consumed me until everything was unlocked and I was back to 100% achievements. If I had to say one bad thing about this DLC, it would have been the lack of enemies they included. Sure, they included like 9 from Castlevania, but some of them are just reskins of existing enemies in the game, while others just roam the halls doing basic melee attacks. I wish they made some more unique ones with their own set of moves, or at least kept some of them locked behind your difficulty level to increase the replayability, like the rest of the game. Because once you've seen everything on normal, you kind of have no need to revisit the Castlevania biomes, unless you're looking for more skins from their bosses. I never played the original Demon Souls, so I took this chance to play it on the PS5 to give it a try. By this point, I've already played Dark Souls 1 and 3 and Bloodborne, so really if you played one of them, you've played them all. What I didn't like most about this game was the Nexus, and how it acted as a hub world for everything. Leveling up, weapon upgrades, storage, shops, everything was there. Now I know most FromSoft games have one more or less, but it's just how this one worked when compared to the rest. In other games, you had to venture out and find new areas, as it's all connected. This one, however, acted as a level select as well, since you gained access to five different areas pretty much at the start of the game, which allowed you to tackle them in the order you want. Usually with a boss's defeat led to a higher level area, hinting to you that you need to come back to it later. So you're hopping between areas in the hub quite often. This combined with how NPCs would come and go in the Nexus a lot made it kind of annoying, since after every boss you'd have to come back and check around every corner on different floors and every nook and cranny of the hub looking for them, as they all tend to move around on you and hide. Even one of the required NPCs near the start of the game is hiding amongst statues on the top floor. I'm glad I played it, but Death felt a bit lackluster compared to its sequels. Of the FromSoft library, I only have Elden Ring and Sekiro left to play. I'm sure I'll enjoy those more than this one though. I had already recently finished the original Deponia game in 2022, so the story was still fresh enough in my mind to remember what's what and who's who in this. I still think that for a modern point and click adventure, this franchise knows how to do it right. Compared to some other modern ones that hold your hand, tell you what items are needed to move on, or just solve the puzzle for you, this one holds no punches to the point where I think it's up there with the retro classics like Monkey Island or Day of the Tentacle. Not only being up there, but maybe even having a more interesting story than some of them as well. With this game's focus on time travel as a plot device, it was kind of a letdown that some segments were just reusing areas from earlier in the game. Sure, it makes sense plot-wise, but it just felt like they were taking the easy way, not having to create new areas like they were in the, for every episode in the first game. If anything, they could have reused areas from the first game just to add a hint of nostalgia for players who have played the entire thing. Unfortunately, like the first, the ending isn't a happy one. Luckily, I didn't follow the game's development or the director's updates as it was implied early that the game was somewhat going to be a middle finger to fans, which would have affected my mindset going into this. The biggest surprise, even if it's not that important to the game, was that David Hayter did some voice acting for this and voiced Old Man Rufus in the opening scenes, just slapping the solid snake voice on him to make him seem tough. Breath from my chest. You could see everything from up here. The destruction. The hopelessness. And the button that would simultaneously release the bomb clamps in countless blast towers. All over Deponia. Chill ran down my spine when I saw the bomb. I just snuck my hood. When the game came out, I was told by others it's just a boy's road trip across the country to see Noctis' fiance. That and the amount of DLC releases they promised just killed my interest in it fast. When I eventually got around to playing this, I was pretty surprised, since no one mentioned the entire invasion of the kingdom, main character being pronounced dead, and him trying to reclaim the throne. This all happens in the first hours of the game too, so there's a lot I was misinformed about. The plot of the game gets kind of confusing in the second half though, since there's a lot of time skips and while you were gone moments. They all are explained in the DLC bundles, but really why weren't some of these story points included in the base game? Was the Cup Noodle crossover really that more important than explaining why Ignis is blind after fighting Leviathan? It just felt like there were holes. Luckily I played the Royal Edition so the DLCs were included, but that's no excuse for having an incomplete story in the base game. All around it was just a mindlessly fun hack and slash dungeon crawler. Throughout the game though, there were a lot of minor annoyances that just built up over time. Like not being allowed to drive at night, being forced to watch the same cinematics with no skip option, and fast travel sometimes was restricted to an unskippable driving sequence, sometimes being 10 minutes long depending on how far away the place is. When I eventually got access to the boat and told to head to another kingdom, I thought the game was about to open up big time. 
At that point though, the game actually becomes just back-to-back -back short chapters with no room for exploration anymore. Just back-to-back -back dungeons almost. I could go on about the pros and cons of this game, as well as how Square Enix could have made it better, but this video is for short reviews. Now for some reason, some people are calling Grime better than Metroid games. I don't see it at all. It's got exploration bound to acquired abilities, sure, but it felt more like a 2D Dark Souls game with stat scaling weapons, giant pattern recognizing bosses, cryptic lore, you know, the usual Dark Souls stuff. The best part being the parry system though, and just how satisfying it was to see that giant head absorbing an animation. At face value, this game was very grey and brown, likely because the game is about beings made of rocks and dirt, living in caves and catacombs. It was somewhat rare to find areas of color, but even in those areas I wasn't in for too long. Right from the start, I felt the game was floaty and unpolished, like an in-development game made in Unity. This may be hard to describe, but I could really see this when some of the items were just layered on top of another, as if they weren't really blending together in the game, but just instead bound on the same point of reference. The highlights of this game basically all come from the big cool bosses, with this giant undead bird being the coolest one of them to me. Outside of bosses, the enemy's roster isn't that great. Each area introduced some new ones, but at some points I'd go minutes without seeing a single enemy. My chat was even keeping track of the encounters, and in some instances we were still in single digits before reaching a new area or the current area's boss. The fact this game is getting a sequel also confuses me, as I haven't found much praise for this game other than its Dark Soul-like bosses. I remember seeing the original trailers for this game and how in interviews they really pushed the idea that it was an homage to Chrono Trigger. That's all this game really had going for it though, to the point where you even learn X-Strike within the first hour and think, I remember that, to get those nostalgia feels. After those feelings die down though, the game just kind of feels hollow. If you played Final Fantasy X, the plot is more or less the same in regards to Setsuna being the equivalent to Yuna, and everyone else being Guardians. The cast of characters isn't that memorable however, and even half of their names felt like they were phoned in, with names like Ender and Kerr and Nadir, who's also the best character by the way. If you're looking to introduce a friend to RPGs, however, or need a quick fix, this is the perfect game. The battles aren't too complex, the usual RPG tropes are all in it, and the game isn't a large sinkhole for time. For a Square Enix RPG, this game is really short, being only about 15 hours long to finish the story. The game even gives you the usual airship and says the final battle's over there. There were some stat check bosses, however, where their damage output and speed was just so extreme you knew it was grinding time. The best praise I can give to it is its soundtrack, though made up entirely of piano scores, to go with the game's winter-themed world. It just felt like the perfect pairing for the game. It sometimes felt as though the entire soundtrack was one long song, as it transitioned well together between regions and fights. The story was nice, but I felt it could have been better told if through it like an anime, so that it wasn't hidden behind a primitive RPG, with some really polygon-looking characters, by the way. Now for It Takes Two, if you've been on my channel for a bit, you may have seen my hour-long It Takes Two video where I played the entire game on my own, so my experience with this game may be a bit more unique than most would get from it. If you want the full story, you can head over to that video too, but for a quick review though, the game is pretty fun. I could easily see the fun you could have with a friend or partner to play it. There's a little something for everyone here, ranging from hack and slash adventure games, platforming segments, and even a full chess minigame. The game did feel a little easy, even with one player, as there is an infinite life system. So having two players may make things even easier. The plot was a bit stretched out, as the main subject about fixing relationships didn't start until halfway into the game. I felt they could have blended the first half a bit better to relate to Dr. Akeem's lessons more. Make it eight lessons instead of four, because I'm pretty sure there's more to relationship than just four things. From the initial reveal during the PlayStation 5 announcement, the bit of gameplay I saw, and the cute little mascots it had, I thought this was just going to be a cutesy little game. One night I decided to try it out and change my mind after getting to the first real boss. This game had Dark Soul-like bosses that took multiple attempts to see attack patterns and notice weak points. These guys just got more annoying once you unlock hard mode and learn that they have additional phases in there too. As soon as I started playing and felt the 60 FPS platforming, it just brought me back to games like Jack and Daxter and the original Ratchet and Clanks. Even after just playing the newest Ratchet and Clank on the PS5, this game just felt all around better for a new age game. Even if it was actually a PS4 game too. As big as the world was, it did feel a bit short since there was only actually two regions to explore in a village before gaining access to the final region, which just acted as the final boss room. 
The game ends on an open note though, so I wouldn't be surprised if we got a sequel starring an older Kenna with a new mechanic perhaps to replace the rot. Maybe even focus more on her backstory that they kind of tease throughout this game too. As a game, this one felt a bit too short. Just about three hours to beat, that's not including the DLC bundles since I didn't have access to those. The game plays similar to Limbo and Inside, in that majority of the rooms you are usually just running in one direction or hiding from a big monster. There are some puzzles along the way, but nothing too complex than solving a how do I open this door kind of situation. I didn't really find anything memorable about this one, but the only complaint I did have about it was how vague some scenarios were, and only having a few seconds to choose. Like if I was supposed to run or hide during a chase segment, or that I was actually supposed to jump to a chain in the corner of a room to survive, leading to some trial and error moments. The plot is also pretty vague and left to your interpretation, but nothing is really explained to you by the end, giving you more questions than answers, if anything. I haven't played two yet, and I know the third is just around the corner, coming out sometime this year. Maybe those will explain the story a bit more, but I don't think I'll be rushing out to play them either. I'll likely wait until they're both free on, like, PlayStation Plus. With the Switch Online library expanding, I decided to give this one a try. I'm glad I did though, because this game was fun right from the start. People praise Mario RPG for the timed attacks and defense system, but this game redefines that concept. Not only are you timing attacks for more damage using fists or hammers, you're also dodging attacks, knocking attacks back, and blocking. Sometimes even doing nothing is the best option. Every enemy is unique, and sometimes using your hammer or fist isn't the best option. Like punching a spiny, that's a bad idea. This constant changing of enemies and abilities keeps you on your feet for every fight you're in. Never are you mindlessly just mashing A to get through a random encounter. Eventually you even learn special combo moves requiring timed attacks from both brothers, each using a separate button to do massive damage if you time it right, with Mario map to A and Luigi to B. There's even a Metroidvania aspect since some of these skills apply to the overworld, gaining access to new areas and finding new secrets. Safe to say I felt the gameplay was way more involved than Mario RPG as they're always throwing new ideas at you. Plus, how many games does Luigi get magic powers and the ability to control lightning? The story in this game was pretty lighthearted, and comedy moments actually made me laugh, too. I'm definitely interested in playing the rest of this franchise if they're this fun and unique. You should, too, if you're looking for more games like Mario RPG in your life. While I was bedridden for a few days and it was on Switch Online, I decided to give this one a replay. I remembered the opening hours in Adam more than anything, but what I didn't remember was just how area locked Samus was throughout this game. It was more so a mission-based Metro game, with Adam, your AI partner, locking you into certain areas until you completed your mission. Sure, there were the backtracking moments, but very rarely were you able to actually fully explore the map and revisit previous areas. Adam was also somewhat annoying in how he'd just spoon feed you with what needs to be done and how to do it. Similar to his role in Metroid Dread recently too, but not that extreme. The horror aspect in this was also pretty good with SAX running around. Although these movements were really brief. I can recall maybe only three of these scenes off the top of my head. If Nintendo were to remake Fusion, I'd expect them to replicate the Emmy moments from Dread, but with the SAX. Randomly blowing up walls to get to you and chasing you down, just being an unstoppable force as you try to hide from it. The hidden missiles and bombs in this were somewhat in abundance too. By the end of the game, I felt pretty stocked up and ready for anything. After finishing the game and learning I only had about 56% of the items, I was pretty surprised by how many more there were to grab. It seemed like they wanted to overstock just so that players would find something along the way, just to be sure they had at least some upgrades in their adventure. Pizza Tower, I was counting down the days for this one. The cartoon art style to movement just wowed me since the initial reveal. On playing it, it was exactly what I thought. Just a fast, fun Saturday morning platformer. The plot was pretty straightforward and laid out to the viewer in about five images at the start of the game. The controls felt great as soon as you get through the tutorial area and understand everything Papino can do. And when you get good enough on the levels, it just feels buttery smooth to go top speed throughout the whole stage, watching as your rank grows to that S, as you're mowing down enemies without skipping a beat, and even better when you start going for those perfects. If there's anything bad to say about this one, it would probably be its length, as the tower only had 4 floors to go through with a total of 26 levels, making this somewhat a short game, especially considering you're speedrunning through it all with no time to really appreciate the levels or enemies you blow up along the way. Other than trying to beat your own score though, there's really no replayability in it after you've gotten P rank on every stage too. Getting those P's is where most of your time may go into this game, but getting them is so rewarding. While making this video, Tour to Pizza announced they are working on DLC too for the game, so I'll be counting down the days to play that next. 
I was pretty happy to finally get around to playing the new Ratchet and Clank, as I've been a fan of this series since the beginning. Unfortunately, this game was just a non-stop disappointment. The biggest being how they utilize their cast of characters. The friends are almost not in the game. They all make an appearance at the start, sure, but after that, they're replaced with their alternate dimension equivalents as just cameos, getting maybe five minutes of screen time each. The majority of the game is about Ratchet trying to reunite with Clank, and when they eventually do get back together, you still play more as Rivet and Kit by the end. I thought this game was called Ratchet and Clank. The nail in the coffin is that even the plumber doesn't make an appearance. Just a quick mention in passing and some optional dialogue you may not even hear. I've played the entire franchise and Dr. Nefarious is easily my favorite character, with Quark being a close second. So it was a pretty big deal that he was finally back as the main villain, especially with there being two of them now in this game. However, the problem was that both of them combined only get about half hour of screen time. With this new Dimensions Doctor just showing up in the final act, there is no mention of Lawrence either, in either dimension. From the pacing perspective, this felt really streamlined. In the sense that there's almost no exploration, everything is on a straight path. It felt like everyone was in a hurry in this game too. Land the ship, grab the key item, say a joke or two, and get off the planet. ASAP. I felt there's no time to really enjoy each planet we visit, outside of coming back to find a few items needed to 100% the game. Not only that, some of the weapons were just reskins of older weapons from past games. It played like a usual Ratchet and Clank game, sure, but for being one of the big exclusives on the PS5, it just felt like they focused more on the graphics, praising how Clank featured ray tracing rather than putting any real substance into the worlds you visit, or trying to change up the gameplay. From its initial trailers, the interviews, and the demo, I just felt the setting of a Louisiana house was a bit small, especially with this game being on a new age console. Although the game does move on from the baker's home eventually, it just felt a bit too late for me, and it just wasn't enough as it was mainly just for the final act you leave the house. The game also suffered from one annoyance I've been seeing a lot now in recent horror and dark games, is just how much darkness they try to put in a game. They ask you to adjust the brightness at the start of the game, but every TV is different. The default settings are too dark usually, and it results in some areas of a room just being pure black. Make me think I'm walking down a dark hallway when I'm actually just walking against a wall. I can fix this in options, sure, but I just think they need to take into account that TVs vary in brightness. The first person horror did work, however, especially combined with the usual Resident Evil ideas of limited resources, saves, and ammo. Not only were you looking on tables and shelves for items, but you were now checking between furniture and under tables to find any possible equipment. With this being a New Age 2023 game as well, it was a bit odd that there were only like four kinds of enemies to deal with throughout the whole game. This is excluding the bosses of course, but Jack made up three of those bosses. The best thing to come out of this game though was introducing Joe Baker in the DLC, the brother of Jack, who fights everything from gators to swamp monsters with his bare hands. His coolness is also solidified after having the best scene in the entire game that I won't spoil. If you played the DLC though, you know what I'm talking about. If you liked Rogue Legacy 1, you'll love 2. They took everything good about 1 and just cranked it to 11. More classes, enemies, bosses, annoying traits, all contained in a big map with more biomes and providing Metroidvania-like powers. Of every game in this video, this is the one where one more run usually results in at least two more. Controls are pretty user-friendly too, as everything can be remapped to your preference, as well as toggle certain abilities on or off if you don't like them. There is also an approachability menu too, to allow players to customize the difficulty to their preference, making it easier or harder on the fly, including just an all-around god mode if you're into that kind of thing. These settings also didn't affect achievement hunting as well, which is pretty rare in most games. Even if you didn't play the first, that's fine too, you'll barely notice the connection at all in the story. There isn't much to this game's story as well, but if you want to learn about the lore, the bosses, and the characters, it requires a bit of digging, similar to how Dark Souls hides its lore. You'll quickly come to find your favorite classes as well as your least, to the point where you wish you didn't even unlock some of them. I hated Dragon Lancers. Sea of Stars was one of the biggies this year for me. I was counting down the days to play this, especially with it being free on day one on PlayStation Plus. As a big fan of The Messenger, I was excited to see what they'd do with an RPG based on like Chrono Trigger and Mario RPG. As fun as it was though, it felt a bit bare bones. I say that in the sense that there was no wrenches thrown in similar to what they did with the messenger halfway into the game. If you've played the messenger, you know what I'm talking about. If they really wanted to get creative, they could have worked more with Mario and Luigi mechanics where timing buttons did more than just attacking and blocking, but instead dodging attacks or jumping on top of enemies. Really you'll be spending most of your time timing the button just to get more hits off with Moonerang. Even with Mitsuda as a guest composer, they really wanted to sell him being involved with the game's development. 
when in reality he only contributed about 10 tracks, one of them being just 10 seconds long too. It just felt like an all-around safe bet of a game, provide a decent retro RPG experience, use the nostalgia of Chrono Trigger and Mario RPG to appease fans, but take no risks or try anything new like they did with The Messenger. It just didn't feel as quirky as The Messenger did by the end, which really disappointed me. From the story point of view, it didn't matter who you chose at the start. Choosing Valir or Zale didn't mean anything, as most of the time it was Garl taking the lead and doing all the talking. They just felt like empty placeholders, bringing no unique dialogue for choosing either of them. That and most of the time, if they weren't talking with Garl, they were talking about Garl if he wasn't on screen. Every other character you meet, however, was really cool, both visually and plot oriented. Especially Sarai's backstory and Rashan just being the know-it-all with the cool abilities. For NPCs though, no one beats Kanathan. I remember this game being shown off during the PS5's reveal. So I thought it was an exclusive only for it to be made on PS4 and ported to everything else. Even as a PS4 game however, this game was pretty short. The setting it takes place in was nice, and the robots were cool too, but they were kind of wasted as there wasn't much to do besides walk up to them to see what emote they display on their head. After that, there's really no reason to revisit any of them, or even some areas of the map. If this world was used for another game, I wouldn't be opposed to that. Maybe a prequel game focusing on the events leading up to B12 and the city's origins. Platforming was a bit iffy sometimes too, as you needed to be at the precise spot for the jump button to appear. When it did work consecutively though, it felt nice and cat-like. When it didn't, it just turned into a lot of walking back and forth on a plank trying to trigger the jump event. For one playthrough, it was a nice game, but having to replay it for achievements became somewhat annoying due to how much downtime there was with cinematics or slow moments, like following a robot for example or waiting for a specific scene to happen. This Wario game kind of took me by surprise, as I've only played Wario Land 1, but I wasn't expecting a Metroidvania for 3, where finding certain treasure would alter other stages in some way, like water levels changing or platforms being spawned. Sometimes a new level would even just spawn for collecting another piece of treasure. Not only that, but every level had a night and day version too, resulting in different paths opening and closing based on the time, as well as which enemies even spawned. And the attacks were also always a factor to consider, as a lot of them change Wario's state. You can't really die in this game, it just kind of puts you in a different mode. Like turning into a zombie to phase through floors, a ball of yarn to roll and demolish walls, or even flatten Wario to get through some small spaces. One even just slices him in half and kills him, but he's okay after a few seconds. With all these variables to consider in each level, it was almost more of a puzzle game more than anything if you think about it. Though that can also be considered a flaw, as this game required a lot of backtracking and trial and error. Almost no level could be completed in one attempt, as you'd have to return them to the map to switch between day and night, as well as come back after something changed. Plus, some states Wario had to be in just took too long, and out of the player's control. The biggest culprit being this ball of yarn. Look how long this takes. It's impossible to move until the full animation is complete. Another Switch game I wanted to revisit since release was Zelda the Minish Cap. I forgot how annoying Ezlo was, but still not as bad as Fi. Outside of him though, the game still holds up as for Zelda. Just a little too handholdy, however, due to your partner's non-stop advice. I did enjoy the slight usage of the four sword abilities where Link starts dividing into copies. I just wish they were more involved in the game and became an essential system in dungeons, rather than the rare moments where you need to push a big block or multiple switches at once. Finding new sword techniques is always a fun addition to Zelda games. It's a bit rare in the franchise, but always welcome to me. The most annoying aspect of this game to me, and I'm sure other players will agree, are the two RNG-based collectibles required to 100% the game. Kinstones and figurines. You need to match every NPC's kinstone with one of your own. The problem is that, outside of the story-based ones, the shape of a kinstone is RNG, so you may not get the matching piece for a while. Even just purchasing a kinstone from the shop is pretty expensive too, so no matter what, you're scouring for something. Collecting every figurine from this capsule machine also rewards you with the final heart piece in the game. The problem being that the machine requires an RNG currency of seashells that requires more and more shells from you to ensure a new figurine pops out of the machine. Usually I fully complete every Zelda, but with the amount of RNG involved in this one, it just wasn't worth my time. I'm sure many other Zelda players will agree with me on this. The final two Switch Online games I played were the Zelda Oracle games, since I haven't played these since they released 20 years ago. I'm not sure why people praise Link's Awakening more than these, as these have way more going for them. 
I of course played the linked adventure to get the most out of my replay, give me the full story, as well as getting the full experience of using all the secrets and getting all the late game items. I also forgot that each game had a different focus, with ages being more puzzle oriented and seasons being action. Of the two though, I felt ages was more fun, even though I did have some roadblocks along the way during the last few dungeons, due to a lot of backtracking in them. Also, I'd just like to point out how annoying Gorons are in Ages. They are so dependent on Link for everything. I was in those mountains for so long doing every minigame and fetch quest for them to ensure I found every item. Not to mention having to do the most annoying task of them all. Nintendo could easily remake these similar to how they did Link's Awakening for Switch even bundle them together as one to make the $79 price worth it. If Nintendo wanted to go above and beyond though, they could mesh them into one game, giving Link the ability to warp between both kingdoms at any time and not forcing the player to load a different game up just to input a secret or find a new NPC standing around, as well as showing more backstory of Onyx and Varan working with the twins, maybe even add a new boss of having to fight Onyx and Varan together if you play Linked Adventure. It's all there Nintendo, put some effort in, make it. Finally, and I'm sure you knew this game was going to come up, I don't think there's much that can be said that hasn't already been said by everyone else. Game is all around a great time, just on the same map as Breath of the Wild. Some people use that as an argument, saying this is an expensive DLC, but really it's a sequel that just takes place in the same land. What do you want? The real meat of the game comes from how they were able to breathe new life into a map we've already scoured before. This meant providing us with caves and dungeons that fans begged for after playing Breath of the Wild, giving us new reasons to explore everything again finding any new secrets and treasures along the way. The Sky Islands were fun and all, but all those islands combined take up only a fraction of your time when you look at the game as a whole, with the depths being where the real content was. They also had to completely rework the engine to introduce Ascend and Recall, as well as being able to fuse every possible item together, leading to the creation of vehicles and allowing everyone to experience the game on their own way. Some of these concepts were so mind-blowing from a development standpoint that other developers were trying to understand how Nintendo was even able to accomplish this on a Switch. The biggest flaw I feel this game had, as well as Breath of the Wild, was just the amount of repetitive cinematics and dialogue we had to skip through, Shrines being the most glaring example. I shouldn't need to mash through the same dialogue and watch Link receive the blessing every time, followed by the loading screen to leave. There should have been an option to disable these screens so that as soon as I reach the blessing, start the loading screen and put the item in my inventory. The only reason I've got no real interest in replaying these games is because of how much time I've spent waiting around or watching the same animations. Which if you're going for full completion, that's about 3 hours and 7 minutes without skipping the end of Shrine cinematics, and 51 minutes with skipping. This is without factoring in the loading afterwards too. So that's everything from my gaming life in 2023, ranging from retro platformers to the latest big AAA title. I could have beaten more, but my completionist side holds me back, though I'm pretty sure 25 games in a year is definitely my record so far. Let me know what you thought of my quick reviews, or if you have anything to add to them. If anything needs more detail, I'm not against the idea of making bigger reviews for some of the more discussed ones. As usual, you can always like and subscribe so you're prepped and ready for my next release, and be around for my Games of 2024 video next year.